Hello and welcome to Amaze Me, our little BBC Earth show where we try to amaze you as best we can with the latest scientific discoveries from around the world. So hold on to your seats as we prepare to blow your mind. So come on then, what we got today? We're going to be going down to the deep sea. Deep sea. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know that we know less about the very bottom of our ocean than we do about the surface of the moon? I can believe that. Yeah. I can easily believe that. I've had one deep sea experience. Not yeah. personally. I didn't get my suit on and go, <laughs> go right down Prison. there. No, I was very fortunate to be on a boat, the Ambari uh, Research Vessel. Mm -hmm. And we sailed out into Monterey Bay and they had a, an ROV, Remote Operated Vehicle, essentially a robot camera, uh, which went right the way down. And all we did was sail backwards and forwards uh, along um, some transects and they, the camera follows the ship obviously and, and transmits a picture up to all of the screens that we had in front of us so it's quite a strange environment yeah. you know uh, you're sat in a dark room ships bumping around a bit like <laughs> this everyone's just staring at the screen and for hours you see nothing just little flecks just drifting through and then all of a sudden you come across the most bizarre animal we saw these tinafores they were like bizarre lights chandeliers hanging in the water That's and incredible. then lots of squid squid were the most common organism that we saw and very often they were hanging in the water column in a sort of symmetrical position vampire squid was yeah. one of them Massive eyes, extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. Mm. They also yeah. do have massive eyes, don't they, in the deep sea, because it is so dark, so they need big receptors to get as much light as possible to sense their environment. And I worked with deep sea sharks, a group of sharks called Mastellus, and they had those really big eyes as well. They were really quite special. But I have to say, they're not the weirdest fish no. that we've got in the deep sea. I think that title has to go to a group of fish known as the anglerfish. And there's 300 different species of anglerfish. This one here, it's called the fan fin sea devil. Look at that, look at that. How bizarre is it? It's, I mean, I hate to say yeah. it, it's a bit stereotyped, but it's the well, stuff of nightmares, isn't it? It really is. It's like, you know, you couldn't make it up, could you? But it it's does, a monster. it exists. It is a monster. This one is called the snagtooth sea devil. I like the names of them as well. Look at They're that. very characteristic, aren't they? Very yeah. characteristic. Amazing, they? amazing. And another great name for this one. Mm. This one is called the Southern Football Fish. Aptly named. It's quite round, yes. isn't it? Yes. Look at that. What an extraordinary... Look at the tiny eye. They're incredible, aren't they? And they can be found at different depths. This one here is the spiny head sea devil. But they really vary in the environments in which they live. They, some live at a depth of about 300 metres, whereas others live to 4,500 metres below sea level. But we can't even incredible. imagine what it's like down there. Pitch black, mm -hmm. enormous pressure, extraordinarily yeah. cold, I imagine. Extraordinarily cold. And not many nutrients, so everything's at really low densities. You yeah. know, that's why when we were dragging our ROV along you know for ages we just didn't see anything no because it's a really hard environment to live in so animals that do exist there have to have very specific adaptations in order to combat with its environment and these group of fish have a very specific adaptation this is the, what they're most famed for they have this luminous lure that hangs over the top of their head which is really characteristic and it's basically this fleshy lump which has lots of bacteria in it, which is able to illuminate. And then that attracts in all their prey and they're able to eat it with their incredibly wide mouths. Hold on, hold on. Go on. Because I've delved into my skull collection and come up trumps. And am I looking smug? Yes, yes I'm are. looking smug. I know you are, yeah. I'm looking very <laughs> smug because I have an anglerfish skull. Oh, you couldn't make so it up. That's so cool. But I'm so envious of your angler. Look at that. Here it is, here it is. It's very delicate, okay. isn't it? Very delicate. It's yeah. got those amazing amazing teeth here and then look what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna hold it up to the camera so we can get a better view of it um so firstly here's the top view and you can see those extraordinary teeth yeah there like that but then look if i hold it sideways you might just be able to see that little spine sticking out of the top of its head that's where the lure was yeah. it's called the elysium the elysium but it's amazing, isn't it? And the size of their mouth is amazing. I never knew this, but they can swallow prey that's double the size that they are, which is remarkable. Yeah. And this has to be said, this is a female. 
And this brings me on to my next room. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Go I've on. just got to have a little bit of time for romance. Oh, no. We love science, yeah. but a little bit of romance you is nice as well. Romance. I'm actually touching something, mm. part of the fabric of an animal that could have been living 4,500 metres beneath the sea, yeah. using this to attract small fish and then sucking them in through this giant mouth. And it's I've incredible. I've got it in my hands. It somehow connects me to that world. I like that. Okay. Yeah, a bit more of an understanding about there it. There we are, a little bit romantic, right? That was a little romantic. Break. Getting back to the science. Getting back to the science. <laughs> One of the most characteristic things about these fish is sexual dimorphism. That's the difference between males and females. Now, the males happen to be about 10 times smaller than the females. So this grape here represents my male anglerfish. It's okay. I'm taking right. my yeah. grape. And this melon represents the female. The difference in size is absolutely huge. And if you want to get a bit more creative about it, it's also the size difference between a Chihuahua and a Great Dane. What about yeah. that? Chihuahua Sexual Dane. dimorphism is quite common in the natural world, though, isn't it, when you think about it? What about spiders? Females yeah. much bigger than the males. Uh, what about some birds of prey? Females, you know, much bigger than the males. And typically the females are larger because they have to go through that reproductive process. They have to somehow find the reserves to be able to produce the eggs or the young, something the male doesn't have to do. And in the case of birds, of course, not only produce them, but sit there and incubate those eggs and then maybe care for the young more than the male so it is common but that size difference is that's that's really something isn't it, it is really say. something Look at that. it is really quite phenomenal and what happens is incredible when it comes to mating i'd argue actually the most exciting part of the anglerfish and there's lots of exciting things about anglerfish but this is really special so what happens is the male is a free swimming individual when it's growing but when it does find a female you know it's searching for a female for a really long time in the deep sea when it finds it, it doesn't want to let go so it has specialized mouth parts which grip on to the female now depending on the species this can be temporary so sometimes the male will latch on for a set period of time and then detach itself but for other species, it's permanent. So once the male finds its female, it attaches itself here. The tissue, oh no, my male's gone able. It's the, it's the jaws haven't <laughs> The jaws haven't, there we go, jaws have developed now. It's right in there. And the tissue between the male and female actually combines, interlocks, and they become almost like one organism. So they fuse they together. They fuse together. They share nutrients from to one another that enables them to both live quite harmoniously together. It's extraordinary. And with females, it's not just one male that can attach. It's been known to have as many as up to six males attach onto her body. Well, it may, I mean, the thing is, as I've already mentioned, at those great depths, hostile environment, yeah. very low turnover of carbon, not, not a very active environment in terms of finding food. Things are occurring at very low densities. Therefore, if you're a tiny little ang male anglerfish, the size yeah. of a great, swimming through that vast, deep, cold, dark ocean, when you find a female, you don't want to, and I mean, that's a big day out. It's a big day out. It's and a then, big achievement. And then, you know, mating and leaving her and then hoping for another big day out in the future is too much to ask. No. Stick around. Quite Why literally, not? stick around. Stick on. Stick on and stick around. I think we've got an image of one of these fish mm. because, you know, they're very difficult to study mm. because... Um, they occur at great depths. Yeah. So most of the research that's done is done with specimens in a museum. And you can see one here. Look at that. That's a female. It's okay. This is a female. But yeah, I mean, all of these specimens are so useful because they enable us to really learn more about the organisms themselves. And that brings me on to the greatest discovery. It's really cool, this one. So essentially, when you have something attaching to your body, it is often your body recognizes it as a threat, whether it's a virus, whether it's some sort of disease, your body has a specialized immune system in order to cope with these defenses. So we have something called T cells and these T cells attack the virus, attack the alien body entering because often that poses such a big threat to our livelihoods. So why does a female anglerfish's body, its immune system, not kick out the male because that is an invading alien body. Yeah, it's a separate yeah. organism. It's a separate organism, something which could cause you a lot of damage and a lot of harm if you were if it was a virus or something. It could be catastrophic. So why does it do that? Well, new science has revealed something pretty amazing. The female anglerfish, half of its immune system essentially is shut off. It doesn't exist. 
it doesn't have half of its immune system. So it's able to accept the male's body whilst having some defences against viruses that it might come across. Amazing stuff. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Here's Thomas Bowen. He's the scientist that made this discovery. Yeah. Not in short time, we have no. to say. Nine years they took to find this. They looked at 31 different specimens, which is pretty amazing. And, you know, as says, he just can't believe what he found. Well, I do remember I first found the first sign at the night shift when I was sitting here at, in, in my office and I saw the first data appearing on the screen. I just could not believe it. I went home. I couldn't sleep. So I came back early in the morning, repeated the analysis and just could, wouldn't go away. So I was, it was the biggest surprise I had in, in years. I'm quite interested in this finding because it might give us quite unexpected leads now in how we could possibly treat patients that have these failing uh, adaptive, as we call it, or slow part of the immune system. Because these anglerfishes must have done something to the rapid responder system, and we just have to find out what it is. And then we can perhaps find new ways of treating our patients. We, we have to understand how the body defends itself against these infections. And then maybe we can then somehow enhance upfront type of immunity against such infections. I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic, actually. I probably will not see it in my lifetime, but who knows? I think it, what, it, what it really tells us that we have to explore the diversity that nature gives us. We have to go and look, and not only in the deep sea. There might be something in the jungles or in the, in, up in the mountains that these animals have adapted to, and they found unique ways and rather uh, unexpected ways of dealing with their particular problems. And once we learn about them, then we might find quite new ways of uh, looking at patients and maybe finding new treatments. So we must preserve diversity. Nature really tells us a lot. I love the fact that he discovered it and then he couldn't sleep and he had to rush <laughs> back the next morning. Hats off to Thomas and his team yeah, for that. Massively. Extraordinary piece of work. You know, working with a very small number of animals, difficult circumstances when you can't access the things that you really want to research, yeah. coming up with that sensation. Oh, it's remarkable and it has such big implications for the future of medicine as well, particularly when it comes to things like organ transplants. Now, when, for example, you're looking for a kidney transplant, you have to have a 99% match with the body that's receiving the kidney. Now, that is very specific because the body, of course, could reject the kidney and then it could be quite damaging. So how the anglerfish is able to accept this alien male invader, accept it in, fuse with it and attach together whilst kind of protecting itself against the elements is something we're not entirely sure how it does yet, but new research could figure it out and make our implications for medicine in terms of transplants much safer and brighter in the future. And another thing that Thomas touched upon there, which is you know, really important is, you know, the Earth's biodiversity, which we know that we're losing so rapidly, it is there. And every time we seem to stick our noses deeper into it, it offers us opportunities to improve our lives. If we lose that biodiversity, if we're careless with it at this critical point, then we're wasting those opportunities that Thomas has uncovered yeah. to improve things in terms of medical science. We've got to look after life. We've got to love life and all of it as well. That's our amazed me. We'd love to hear from you. If you hear of any other great discoveries that have come to the fore, then do let us know. It's pretty amazing. My mind has been totally blown by this one today, I have to say. Now, of course, I hope you've been equally as amazed as we have, and we will see you next time for a great new discovery.